Now, which means we've got to wait for the stream to fire up all across the fruited plains of the internet. And I'm looking at the chat here and Vientica says late and Ricada. And then Cole Roberts says late and Vienticus. And then he says late and Zulu. And I think we know what word is supposed to be replacing those names here. And so Rob is late and and something indeed. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to yet another episode of Watching the Watchers Live. My name is Robert Goveya. I am a criminal defense attorney here at the r, &R Law Group, located in the always beautiful and sunny and hot Scottsdale, Arizona. And today, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, we're talking about the collapse of the Democratic January 6th Fake Select Committee. We've got a lot to unpack. Of course, yesterday we spent all all show talking about this woman right here. Her name is Cassidy Hutchinson. And yesterday we were just unpacking a lot of what took place at the hearing. You can see we've got this entire rebuttal section that we're going to get to today. This is this is available, of course, uh, at the mind map on uh, j6mindmap.com. If you want to check that out, you can follow along at home. But here, uh, yesterday, we, we spent all day talking a lot about this steering wheel saga. Remember the steering wheel saga? We're going to revisit this because this is pretty important, consequential testimony. You know, yesterday, the idea was that this could be the first sort of domino, right? We all, we've all here, sitting here, been watching this, knowing that this is a large show trial that is missing a lot of the indicia of legitimacy that you might see in any other type of proceeding. Things like cross-examination, the disclosure of witnesses, the disclosure of evidence, right? So discovery, so you can see and investigate what the allegations are. Even just an oppositional party. I mean, my goodness, that would be pretty amazing if we had just you know, somebody asking like, interesting questions rather than just reading from a teleprompter. And so we've been trying to figure out what the end game is and what the goal, you know, what they're trying to do here is. But all day yesterday was about this steering wheel saga. Apparently what Miss Cassidy Hutchinson saw was Donald Trump driving around in, uh, you know, or attempting to commandeer their presidential limo. And we had all sorts of interesting conversational points about this yesterday. And so we're going to dive into that. Now, there were other problems with this, right? She testified and the, the committee presented evidence that Donald Trump said something. And what we've been seeing is they're taking a lot of this out of context. And so today, after the media and the Internet and, the, you know, the right wingers and the conspirators like me and the insurrectionary individual, the seditious conspiracy domestic homegrown violent extremist terrorists like me. Well, we were able to just sort of, uh, you know, do a little bit more research and we were able to discover that there are a lot more problems with this testimony than we were able to even see at first glance. And so we are going to talk about that. Let me give you a little bit of a preview, show you what's going on, what's coming up. Out of the J6 hearing, we've got reactions on, uh, well, from a number of different people. You can see them all here. We're going to jump in and see what Mr. Raskin had to say for us. He's very offended that some of this is uh, is being challenged now. Adam Kinzinger had a comment. Adam Schiff is also somebody who is saying, well, you know, the Secret Service is a little bit questionable from time to time. I mentioned this on our member morning walk today, but Boris Johnson, this is a fascinating clip, Boris Johnson was talking with Jake Tapper and Jake Tapper is really trying to create a narrative and Boris Johnson just wasn't having it at all. So we'll go through that. AOC wants to eliminate basically all Republicans. We know that this has been a political war and a political expulsion. And then I wanted to share a very interesting clip here from Miss Megyn Kelly, which, you know, I mean, she's Megyn Kelly, you know, and what she says, uh, of course, might sort of rub against the grain for some of the, the pro Trumpers, right? Because Megyn Kelly and Donald Trump have this little bit of a, uh oh, you know, they didn't get along when Donald Trump said that blood was coming out of her wherever or whatever. And you might suspect that Megyn Kelly would be on team January 6th insurrection committee, but she's not. She's got a very astute point that she makes. And so we'll check in with her because you might expect her to, you know, sort of take an anti-Trump opinion on this thing. And she just isn't. So we're going to get through all of that. And then there's a whole separate new issue that has popped up because what happened is that Miss Cassidy Hutchinson is telling us, she said this yesterday, that she actually wrote this note. Okay. She says, I drafted this note and they entered that basically into evidence in this fake little show trial. Turns out apparently she didn't write that note. Somebody else wrote that note. We'll take a look at who that is when we get there. We also are going to have a pretty decent Steve Bannon update on the second part of the program. You can see here today, we've got this 17 page document that was filed yesterday, two days ago, actually, 
Uh, I didn't I didn't want to get into it until today because the government responded and we can see what their response is. But here, this is a, a motion from Steve Bannon to compel, to get us some disclosure, to give us some evidence. And who does it pertain to? Oh, yeah, look, there it is. Mr. Meadows, Mark Meadows, okay? Mark Meadows, of course, was the actual boss of Miss Cassidy, Cassidy Hutchinson. So the Steve Bannon defense now is demanding discoveries, demanding that the J6 committee give them over some additional evidence so that they can actually parse through it and prepare their defense. So as you can see, my friends, my goodness, we just have a lot to get to. And if you want to be a part of the show, the place to do that is over at watchingthewatchers.locals.com. We've got an awesome community over there chatting away in the house. We have Vienticus Prime is holding down the fort. Kelly Sell now, shout out to Kelly Sell now. We've got JC the Music Man. C the Veil is there, along with Wild Child, and they're all just saying hello, chatting in. Now, there's also an awesome way to join and support us on YouTube with this YouTube membership. Jenny B's in the house on YouTube. Zulu is a member. Cool Guy 18,000 is a member. And ZZ the Boxing Cat is a member as well. And we're doing these morning uh, sort of walk and talks where we're just sort of continuing the conversation after the show. And it's actually been a lot of fun. So if you want to join in on that, join up at watchingthewatchers.locals.com or on YouTube. And quick reminder, Tomorrow, we have our member mastermind where we're going to talk about this process that comes out of this book, a very important book called Think and Grow Rich. Chapter 10 talks all about masterminding and why it's important to join communities and join groups that will help facilitate you in reaching your goals and ambitions. And so we're going to talk about that tomorrow. And it was going to be uh, at 1230 Pacific, which would have been 330 Eastern. Now I have to bump that back to 7 p.m. Eastern. I had something that I got to attend to before in the day. And so that is pushed back, which means that is now going to be the same time as the show, which means there's not going to be a show tomorrow. So if you want to be a member, then come join us and support us there at one of our member communities, because there will not be a show tomorrow. And as I've mentioned before, my friends, you know, I know, look, I've gotten some, you know, some emails from people that have like seriously moved me and like made me reevaluate a lot of what I'm doing here. And the point is, if you feel like you're being left out of these conversations because of a financial problem, you know, I know gas prices are high, inflation is high. I know that the world is melting down around us. I've had people send me emails and say, Rob, I love your content. You know, I f I'm feeling left out because I've been sort of, you know, paywalled out of this. I'm a senior, I'm on a fixed income, you know, I just want to let you know. And so, you know, if you need a scholarship to locals, please reach out to me, send me an email, robert at rrlawaz. For some reason, there's a lot of amazing people out there that that donate and pay support us more than that minimum amount. And that allows us to, of course, offer scholarships to you if you need it. If you need it, please send me an email. I don't want you to be left out of this because I know how much this stuff can really, um, really be impactful. Okay, this masterminding process, I've gotten a couple pieces of knowledge in my day that have changed my whole stinking life. And if I can help facilitate that in any way, uh, please let me know. Robert at rrlawaz.com. Sign up on Locals first and then send me your username and I can turn you on. Here, uh, and again, thank you to those of you who who donate and support more over there, right? Some people will, it's five bucks a month, but some people will pay 50 bucks a month, you know, just because they support the work that we're doing. And so I want to pass that along. Thank you to those of you who are, who are, are doing that. And um, we're building a community. So come check us out. We're going to have a mastermind tomorrow in lieu of the show. So masterminding. And if you want to do your homework before we get into it, Think and Grow Rich, this is available on YouTube. The audio book is available all over the place. It's a great chapter. It's a great book. I'd encourage you to read the whole book. Changed my whole life. So uh, I would check it out. I've read that one many, many times. We'll talk about it tomorrow. But okay, anyways, enough of that. Without any further ado, my goodness, let's get into the show already. Rob, what are you doing over there? All right. So my friends, we picked up yesterday talking about Miss Cassidy Hutchinson. And as we talked about at the start of the show, we are going to do a quick recap on this entire assault saga because this thing is really, it has a lot of layers, a lot of levels to it. And we want to unpack what is going on. Remember now that Cassidy Hutchinson is supposedly, she, she works for Mark Meadows. Mark Meadows is the White House, was the White House Chief of Staff for Donald Trump, which means he's like in there, right? He's in the rooms. He's in the middle of the huddle when they go out there on the line of scrimmage. He's like sitting there like calling the plays almost, right? I mean, he is there in with Trump with all of the other cabinet members and all of that stuff. He's the guy who makes stuff happen. So here, Cassidy Hutchinson works for him. So what to happen here is the J6 committee, many people were saying, you know, that that she was in with him. She was a part of that huddle with 
Mr. Mark Meadows, and she could see with eyes and ears everything that was going on, and she could have been, you know, purview or sort of second chair to the entire insurrection. And so that's where we left off. Now, two things came out of this. And what was very interesting, you know, really about this entire saga was the level of uh, enthusiasm that we saw from people in the media. Now, everything is basically changed at this moment in time because uh, what ended up happening. Yeah. So this morning when I went over to CNN, uh, this is sort of, you know, this is this is the current version of CNN right now. But and this is the current version of Drudge. But this morning, I mean, this was all red or, or I, I, and I would definitely say like last night, this was all red. Oh my gosh, Donald Trump hijacked the, uh, the limousine. Donald Trump was, was going to commandeer Air Force One. Donald Trump was, you know, he, he tried to hijack Marine One and he was going to fly this thing into, you know, the Washington Monument in order to save America. Like the whole thing was ridiculous. It was red everywhere. Brett Bayer, Fox News, the whole stinking media was like, oh my gosh, can you believe what Megan, what, what Ms. Cassidy said, Cassidy Hutchinson said? And it's all like not true. Those salacious headlines, we'll see, they appear to be not true. So they all got made for fools. I mean, they all got this, like she dangled this bait, this 25 year old gal came out and was meandering through her synopsis like AOC, you know, doing an Instagram live or something like this and no cross-examination, no vetting whatsoever. And then we get no questions, like no follow-up questions. Just, oh, thank you for your book report. We're done. Media gobbled it up. Now it turns out a lot of that is just not true. As we're going to unpack, we're going to see that even some of the media's own darlings, this guy, remember Eric Hirschman? Remember how much they were salivating over this guy? because he said the F word and he said Donald Trump is an effing felon and all this stuff, remember him? Well, he's saying that Miss Cassidy is also misremembering a bunch of these facts. So we have just sort of multiple areas where she's either being intentionally dishonest or she is like grossly mistaken. And the, the, if that is true, either one of those is true, the committee's legitimacy flies out the window. One, either she's a liar or number two, the committee's incompetent for not vetting her information before they presented it to the American people in the form of an ultra important emergency hearing that we all have to drop everything to attend. Okay, it's bad either way. And so we're gonna go through this in a little bit more detail, but just to make sure that we keep our bearing straight. Let's do a quick recap on what this video was about in the first place. Okay, so this was, this is the whole situation from yesterday and do I want to yeah let's let's do let's 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 start here during and after the rally speech president trump was pushing his staff to arrange for him to come up here to the capitol during the electoral vote count let's turn now to what happened in the president's vehicle when the secret service told him he would not be going to the capitol after his speech First, here is the president's motorcade leaving the ellipse after his speech on January 6th. All right, so now the first thing to note, of course, is yesterday when we were talking about this, we, we actually pulled up the graphic of the beast. Okay, now there's, you know, there's some, some questions about this. She talks about the beast, but this is obviously not the beast, right? This is a separate, this is an SUV type of vehicle, unless we just call whatever the president drives in the beast, sort of like whatever the president flies in is Air Force One, right? So I don't know if that's how this naming convention works. Maybe you can let me know in the chat if you know that, but it's it's not the beast, okay? The beast was the, the limo, and we actually had a video of that or a, a screenshot of that yesterday that we talked about that had all of the different compartments detailed out for us. So here uh, you can see they're actually referencing the SUV. Let's pick back up. Now they're waiting and you can see there's there's no audio now. And so Donald Trump's in the in the vehicle and apparently you know it's hard to tell where he is, right? Like is he right there on the side? He normally he actually does hang out there on the side a lot. Like remember when he had COVID, he was sort of on that rear passenger side and he was, you know, Ms. driving Hutchinson, by giving the thumbs up. When you returned to the White House in the motorcade after the president's speech, where did you go? When I returned to the White House, I walked upstairs towards the Chief of Staff's office, and I noticed Mr. Renato lingering outside of the office. Once we had made eye contact, he quickly waved me to go into his office, which was just across the hall from mine. Okay, so Mark Meadows is like, oh, get in here, like, get in here. Hey, Cassidy, come in here, I gotta tell you something. You, you know, you're my assistant, but get in here, I need, I need, I need, like, urgent news for you. 
When I went in, he shut the door. I noticed Bobby Angle, who is the head of Mr. Trump's security detail. Okay, Bobby Angle, head of security detail. We've already got him listed out in the mind map, and he's already given depositions with the J6 committee. So if if you know if he's the head of the Secret Service, okay, the head of the security detail, don't you think that is a relevant fact if Donald Trump reaches his hand through the divider on a you know on, on a presidential motorcade and assaults a Secret Service agent? Sitting in a chair, just looking somewhat discombobulated and a little lost. Just poor, um, poor Mark. I looked at Tony and he had said, did you effing hear what happened in the Beast? Okay, so, to so now Tony Ortega, I think, is going to be his name. And we're having multiple conversations, right? All hearsay. This is all conversations that are taking place outside of court, being offered for the truth of the matter that is being asserted here that Donald Trump assaulted a secret service agent. This is all conversation to try to prove that. All hearsay, all objectionable. None of it would come in in a regular trial. We'd want to hear from somebody who saw what happened, but not somebody who heard from somebody else what they heard happened and they weren't even in the vehicle, but somebody referenced it to them and it all came back to her. Now Mark Meadows says, get in my office here, Cassidy. I got to tell you something. So she comes in and did you effing hear what happened in The Beast? Is that what she said? Let's back up. Just looking somewhat discombobulated and a little lost. Um, I looked at Tony and he had said, did you effing hear what happened in the beast? In the beast? I said, no, Tony, I, I just got back. What happened? Why would I know? Tony proceeded to tell me that when the president got in the beast, he was under the impression from Mr. Meadows that the off the record movement to the Capitol was still possible and likely to happen, but that Bobby had more information. So once the president had gotten into the vehicle with Bobby. Okay, so Bobby's there, Bobby Engel, right? Who's already testified. So he, he would have, have had first direct hand witness knowledge of what took place, right? I mean, when you, when you bring a witness in, you say, well, what did you see next? Well, I saw him slap him in the face. I saw him put his hand on a gun. I saw something like this happen, right? That is direct observational evidence that you can communicate because somebody can ask you about that. They can challenge those questions or those statements. I said the light was green. Somebody can challenge that because I saw that observation and they can cross examine me on that. But if I say somebody else said the light was green, then I can't cross examine. I can't do a cross examination of that person because they're not in court. So this is a huge problem. You know, huge evidentiary problem that it basically invalidates all of this testimony. Okay. All of it automatically is invalidated. Now, part of the problem with this hearing is that people are saying that, you know, we should give it some legitimacy because I guess, it, I, I guess there's Democrats on there and they're Congress people. Like I still haven't gotten any explanation as to why this is a legally constituted illegal committee. And we'll get there after I close this video out. I forgot to do that, but this, right. And, and what people are saying now is that this has a modicum of legitimacy. Why? Just because it's happening, I guess. But the regular safety valves that we have, the regular checks and balances that exist in our court system are there for a reason. They are there to ensure that we have credible witnesses and legitimate evidence. And if we take away those protective safety valves, if we take away the railing, people are just going to fall right over. And that's what's happening here. I mean, they really kind of shot themselves in their own foot here because if they would have gone through a more legitimate process, some of these ideas, some of these narratives, they would be battle tested. They would be hardened. They would be able to come out and say, I know for sure this happened and here's why. But because these people, I mean, honestly, they're getting high on their own supply. That's how we call this out, out, out here on the streets, getting high on their own supply and just believing everything that they say. And they think that nobody's going to challenge them on any of this stuff. And so they bring this young lady in and she's just, you know, I don't know big debut. And here she goes. Let's listen. He thought that they were going up to the Capitol. And when Bobby had relayed to him, we're not. We don't have the assets to do it. It's not secure. We're going back to the West Wing. The president had very strong, a very angry response to that. Um, Tony described him as being irate. She's describing this like she was there, right? So like, is, this is a weird thing because she wasn't there. This is somebody else explaining to her what happened. And, and, does, and do people tell stories this way? I don't, I don't think so. I'm the effing president arm. 
Mr. Engel. Sir, you need to take your hand off the steering wheel. Okay, that's a that's a very specific statement. So, Mr. Engel, he better come in and be able to confirm that for us, right? Before, look, I don't want to hear that this lady was playing a game of telephone, okay? That Tony heard it from Engel, who then told it to, to Cassidy, who then just put it out here in front of America, okay? No mulligans here. No, uh-oh, this was a mistake. Oh, I screwed up. I guess I guess I got it wrong, you know? Absolutely not. Okay. You don't get a do over on this. Your testimony better be damn on point, not close. Not even, you know, not what do they say? Close only counts in horseshoes and hand grenades, not in court proceedings. You got to be on point here. And if you're, if you're wrong, that shatters the entire facade. I mean, the entire balloon pops, the umbrella, the, the, the veil has been pierced. And now we can see that basically everything else that I think that comes out of her mouth and everything else, in my opinion, that comes forward from this committee, apparently, right? Maybe it hasn't been vetted. I mean, who's doing any of the vetting? Who cares? They just put it out there and they shove it down our gullets. So here, let's pick, let's wrap up with this one. We're going back to the West Wing. We're not going to the Capitol. So this is angle with a physical touch with the president. Okay, like sort of like assaulting the president. <laughs> and nobody knew about this until today. This lady has testified multiple times in front of depositions in front of the committee. And they're just now dropping this shocking, you know, hearing on us now because this woman is facing public pressure or something. Mr. Trump then used his free hand to lunge towards Bobby Angle. And Mr. when Mr. Renato had recounted this story to me, he had motioned towards his clavicles. And was Mr. Look at that face. She's full of it. Look at this face right here. Is she trying to, she's, I think she's doing one. She's trying not to burst out laughing. I think, right. Isn't that face kind of one of these, like, <laughs> right. That kind of looks like she's about to just bust kind of like, uh Oh, <laughs> <They're buying this. laughs> so I don't really know. Anyways, let's wrap this up. And was Mr. Engel in the room as Mr. Ornato told you this story? He was. Okay, so Ornato referenced it, okay, but Angle didn't deny it. So Angle was the person actually in the vehicle, so they know that this is really, really bad uh, testimony. So they say, well, did Angle deny that this happened? I mean, look, if Angle, if this really did happen, why is Angle not here testifying about this? Why is this lady who didn't see any of it happen? We know who it happened to. Why isn't he here to talk about it? Did Mr. Angle correct or disagree with any part of the story from Mr. Ornato? Mr. Engel did not correct or disagree with any part of the story. Okay, so therefore it happened because Engel was sitting there and he didn't jump out and say, uh, that's not true. They're gonna, I guess that's factual. I guess that's a fact. Well, you didn't deny it. It's like, I went in and said, there's uh, pots of gold at the end of a rainbow. You didn't deny that, they, you know, you just sat there and you just like sat there. So you didn't deny that it exists. So therefore it exists, idiot. And I'm off to get my pot of gold. Did Mr. Engel or Mr. Ornato ever after that tell you that what Mr. Ornato had just said was untrue? Neither. All right. So that just goes on. Neither one of them said it's untrue, blah, blah, blah. You get the gist of this. Now, pretty, pretty consequential testimony, right? Donald Trump assaulted a secret service officer to the point that the secret service officer had to uh, sort of, you know, grab his hand and then protect his clavicle from a violent maniac, Donald Trump, who was trying to seize America. Now we had talked about some of this, you know, relative to the, the beast, right? And there is a divider that it looks like does come down, but, uh, actually Hunter Biden's crack dealer on our locals community. I forgot to clip this. Sorry, hunters crack dealer, but Hunter's crack dealer was telling us, Rob, I spent a lot of time in limos and driving limos, I think driving or, or main, maintaining or something like that. And he says, it, it's almost impossible. Like that, that distance would be, it's too far, right? Like, just think about that in a limousine. Like you've got, you know, the sea, I don't know what the beast looks like, but it, it's far. Anyways, the whole thing's ridiculous. So we go back to the mind map. Now, something came out today. Uh, several several different clips actually. The Secret Service apparently they're communicating to us that uh, none of this. Well, let's go through it. Anthony Guglielmi, he is the Secret Service communications chief, and now since his agency has been invoked, we're going to learn more about this guy. Now you can see over from LinkedIn, he is the chief of communications for the United States Secret Service, secretservice.gov. He's got a, a, almost 5,000 followers on LinkedIn. 
And he is going to be the person who is responding to some of this nonsense. And here's what they reported over from Politico, I believe. Yeah. And they tell us the Secret Service says the January 6th committee didn't reach out before Hutchinson's explosive testimony, right? Like, uh uh-oh, like, so they didn't come to clarify any of this. Let me back up a quick minute. Remember that yesterday, one of the, the, the first responses to this was from this fella, Peter Alexander. Peter yesterday told us, a source close to the Secret Service tells me both Bobby Engel, okay, the lead agent, and the presidential limousine SUV driver are prepared to testify under oath that neither man was assaulted and that Mr. Trump never lunged for the steering wheel. Okay, that came out like yesterday hot. 3.24 3.24 p.m. Then we finally got an update from the Secret Service, and they were telling us uh, that, yeah, they never even came to sort of verify this, right? And Engel has already testified. Engel, from a Secret Service agent, has already sat down with the January 6th committee multiple times. And apparently, it never came up. So why is it coming up now? They published this today, the 29th, says the January 6th committee didn't reach out to the Secret Service in the days before it aired the explosive testimony about an alleged physical altercation between Trump. In a blockbuster Tuesday hearing, former Trump aide said that the president was irate and, quote, lunged toward the head of the detail. But Anthony Guglielmi, who we just learned about, the Secret Service chief of communications, told Politico that select committee investigators did not ask Secret Service personnel to reappear or answer questions in writing in the 10 days before the hearing before Hutchinson got up there and took the stand or whatever that chair is. It's not a stand. She's just sitting there on a stinking kitchen table. We were not asked to reappear before the committee in response to yesterday's new information, and we plan on formally responding on the record. We have and will continue to make any member of the Secret Service available. They have been available, right? They've been available the whole time. During her testimony, she explained a shocking event. She told the committee that Cipollone and all of them were trying to, you know, hijack America. And everybody praised her for coming forward. Benny Thompson said that she was very brave because of this courageous woman and others like her. The American people will not have the truth hidden from them which is a total joke because uh, you know, evidently, as we're going to find out, this uh, it all is fake. It's not accurate. Secret Service comes amid questions about the aspects of her testimony. The story about Trump's behavior, Trump said, or Hutchinson said that it was relayed to her by a top aide called Tony Ornato. And her claim to have a written note is also problematic. Earlier in the year, the committee asked the head of the detail about this, Robert Engel, and he gave testimony, they say, that appears to be consistent with Hutchinson's story, but it doesn't describe the stunning details that Hutchinson described. Okay, so listen, we can click this story and go over here. This is the story, and this one is from uh, actually about a month ago, 6-8. This is when actually Engel went and testified, and his story sort of does corroborate that one aspect of her story where she says that Trump wanted to go back to the White House. Okay, Engel noted that they went, they, they did go to the White House instead of going over to Capitol Hill. The contents of his testimony, though, have not been previously reported, according to this. And Anthony Guglielmi declined to, con- to comment. Okay, so like, in other words, this, this part of the story has already been asked and discussed, and we already know the details about this. But now it's all changed because of what we now have learned from Miss Cassidy Hutchinson. So the Secret Service now telling us that no, nobody there uh, contacted us. They never tried to get any clarity on this on this process at all. We're going to see what Robert Engel has to say. Of course, there are other witnesses from the Trump Secret Service driver. Right? Who is that person? Who's the name of that person? Anthony Ornato is another individual we have not heard from yet. So these are sort of open questions. ABC News gave us this report. They also are hearing that from their sources. They're saying that, yeah, the Secret Service, uh, you know, denied Donald Trump from going to the Capitol, but he also didn't assault them. The Secret Service so far is not commenting on specifics, but they just informed me that it would like to respond. The Secret Service would like to respond under oath. Two sources familiar with the investigation confirmed that President Trump had requested to go to the Capitol on January 6th and that the Secret Service refused due to security concerns. One of those sources telling me that the president did return to the vehicle after his speech on the morning of January 6th and asked Agent Robert Engel if he could go to the Capitol. Engel said something to the effect of that being unwise or dangerous and that the motorcade was going to take the president back to the White House. 
A source close to the Secret Service just told me to expect that the Secret Service will push back against oh. any allegation of an assault against an agent or President Trump reaching for the steering wheel. We'll push back because it didn't happen. And now that that captured the headlines all day yesterday, right? All day. People were hyperventilating about that. Brett Bayer, everybody on Fox News. Oh my gosh, I don't believe Donald Trump. You know, oh my gosh, these people are so dumb. Can you take two seconds to think for yourself before you copy and paste the headlines from some other journalist who's just vomiting, spring-loaded, listening to the hearings and say, hijacked limo, spring-loaded. Just pop, oh, oh, I got to tweet this. Shut up a minute. I got to tweet. Hold on a minute. And they do that. And you know, around and around we go. And then they all get caught with their pants down. They should be embarrassed and ashamed of themselves because it's a stupid story. And of course, it's being covered by mostly children. All right. So that's the assault portion of this and why this thing was such a debacle. Now, the second big problem here before we get into the reaction, a lot of reaction from a lot of people today, which was it's going to be sort of a video heavy in a minute. But here, what we'll see is this note was also the subject of a lot of debate. And now for this one, I pulled up actually the transcript, right? Because this one's pretty important. So here is the note. You can see this. This uh, was, this is actually publicly available over at Rev.com. They transcribe a lot of the uh, the public publicly sort of important things. And so the entire proceeding is actually transcribed. And if we get down to about a minute thirty six, we're going to see where where sort of the the, the key bits about this note uh, picks up. All right. So here, right, it starts off. And you told us that the White House counsel's count, uh, office was in camp encouraging the president to tell the rioters to leave, right? And then she plays a part of her book report. And then it goes, now let's look at one example of what senior advisors to the president were urging. Okay, so now the theory is, is that we pick this up. Miss Cassidy is in, is, is in the middle of the huddle, right? All of Trump's advisors are around him. The cabinet is trying to figure out what to do. You've got you know, uh, Mark Milley and uh, Nancy Pelosi talking about the 25th Amendment and all sorts of stuff, right? It's all sort of uh, uh, chaotic. And they say, Cassidy, you're sitting there, you're this, uh, this advisor, you hang out with Mark Meadows and all this. So let's look at what some of the senior advisors were urging and we'll pick it up from here. Now let's look at just one example of what some senior advisors to the president were urging. Ms. Hutchinson, could you look at the exhibit that we're showing on the screen now? Okay, so they're going to put Have this on the screen. This? Now, let's detach this and blow this up a little bit just so we can see exactly what's happening here. And we'll scroll this up. Um, have you seen this note before, right? Here she is. Let's go back. Note before. That's a note that I wrote at the direction of the chief of staff on January 6th. Okay, did you see that right there? That's the note that I wrote at the direction of the chief of staff on January 6th, likely around 3 o'clock. Okay, now she's saying I wrote that. So they put that up on the screen. Now, I will tell you this, uh, just, I, I, no, I didn't, we didn't talk about this yesterday, but just from looking at that note, I would say that is a male writing that note, if I had to guess. Why? Because that sort of looks like my handwriting. <laughs> I, wrote, I write in all caps, basically, uh, and it's not very legible, right? So I would say that it's probably mine. Now, I don't think, you know, I could be wrong. Maybe that's female handwriting. I don't know what you have to say about this, but. Uh, but I, but it doesn't look all that feminine to me. Call me a misogynist if you want to. All right, that's fine. Here, uh, now we're going to go back to this. I wrote that note at the direction of the chief of staff, likely around three o'clock. I wrote it. O'clock. And it's written on a chief of staff note card. But that's your handwriting, Miss Hutchinson. That's my handwriting. That's and my why handwriting. Did you write this note. That's my handwriting. Chief. She said right there. It's written on the chief of staff note card, but that's your handwriting? Yeah, that's my handwriting. And why did you write this note? The chief of staff was in a meeting with Eric Hirschman and potentially Mr. Philbin, and they had rushed out of the office fairly quickly. Mark had handed me the note card with one of his pens and started dictating a statement for the president to potentially put out. Okay, so remember this guy, Eric Hirschman. Okay, Eric Hirschman is this fellow right here who the media was just absolutely in love with. Remember him? I mean, they were just salivating over this guy because he said the F word a couple times. And he said that John Eastman is a wackadoodle. And, you know, he said, you're an F and F and this and F and mother and F and your, your sister and your brother and F all F at all, basically. And the media is, oh my gosh, this guy's crazy. He's like Michael Avenatti. Oh my gosh. 
we have a Michael Avenatti store brand and we have a, a Christine Blasey Ford store brand here in the same hearing. And they're both just like, oh, my, this is like the Avengers coming together. It's just incredible. So Eric Hirschman, though, is somebody who she referenced. OK, she said that he was there at this meeting. I mean, he was actually a part of it. Right. He, she uses his name right here. The chief of staff, meaning Mark Meadows, was in a meeting with Eric Hirschman and potentially Mr. Philbin. So potentially like she doesn't remember, maybe. He was there and they had rushed out of the office fairly quickly. Mark had handed me the note card with one of his pens and started dictating a statement for the president to potentially put out. And it gets caught up here. Let's 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 go back. Started dictating a statement for the president to potentially put out. And no, I'm sorry. Go ahead. That's no, OK. Uh, uh, what happened here? What the heck happened? My whole thing just froze. Now, let's look at just one example of what some senior advisors to the All president. All right. So here, why did you write this note? Let's Ms. play Hutchinson. here. It's okay. uh, there are two phrases on there, one illegal and then one without proper authority. The illegal phrase was the one that Mr. Meadows had dictated to me. Dictated to me. Mr. Hirschman had chimed in and said, also put without legal authority. There should have been a slash between the two phrases. It was an, an or if the president had opted to put one of those statements out. Evidently, he didn't. Later that afternoon, Mark came back from the Oval Dining Room and put the palm card on my desk with illegally crossed out, but said we didn't need to take further action on that statement. So um, to your knowledge, this statement was never issued? It was, to my knowledge, it was never issued. All right, so that's the statement. Now, the big part of this, of course, uh, that's your handwriting. That's my handwriting. Right? And look, look, maybe it is. I don't know. But we have a little bit of a counter narrative now forming because it turns out maybe she didn't actually write that. Eric Hirschman is now out with the statement. Eric Hirschman uh, here, the J this guy, right? Remember this guy with the creepy panda behind him? Former Trump White House lawyer Eric Hirschman, this is back on June 23rd before this whole thing started blowing up in their face. They were so excited about this guy, right? Almost 500,000 views on this video. They said that Eric Hirschman was commenting on Jeff Clark's plan to overturn the election. And they said, congratulations. Remember, they played this clip like 35 times. I think Liz Cheney has this on repeat at home when she goes to bed at night. Congratulations. You just admitted your first step or act you would take as attorney general would be committing a felony. Remember that talking about John Eastman and how excited they are about this whole saga. So that's his, that's this guy. Okay, that's who we're talking about. Now he also is this right. There's the creepy panda behind him. We've commented on that kind of a weird deal with the justice bat. Like he cracks people over the head with a bat. I don't know. Strange. But the point is, is he is now out with the statement and he is disputing that she wrote that note. Cause she called him, called his name out in this whole proceeding right now. She said that he was in there and he was dictating a bunch of stuff, this, that, and the other. And so Hirschman's people now say Trump white house lawyer disputes Cassidy Hutchinson's testimony about the handwritten note. And she said specifically, that's my handwriting. You sure? Yes. It's my handwriting. I wrote it. Mark handed me the pen and I wrote the whole thing. <laughs> what? Okay. So now you have a conflict between your own witnesses. Like it's not, it's not a, it's not a minor thing either. This is something that can spiral outside of the whole, you know, stinking, it, it, the, the wheels come off the whole vehicle here. So they put this out. Now he responded former Trump. This is from ABC news. Okay. Former Trump white house lawyer, Eric Hirschman is claiming that a handwritten note regarding a potential statement for president Trump to release during the attack was written by him was written by him during a meeting at the White House that afternoon and not by the White House aide Cassidy Hutchinson. Sources familiar with the matter tell ABC News. Hmm. Well, that's crazy. Yeah, Tuesday's hearing, Cheney displayed a handwritten note, which Hutchinson testified that she wrote after Trump's chief of staff, Mark Meadows, handed her the note and say, write this down. Sources familiar with the matter said that Hirschman had previously told the committee that he had penned the note. Do you see what that says there? Sources familiar with the matter said that Hirschman had previously told the committee that he penned the note. So they knew that and they presented it to America anyways. These people are disgusting, right? This would be like a prosecutor knowing that a witness was lying and presenting the evidence anyways. Can you believe that? Uh, 
it, it really is reprehensible. This would be like disbarment, right? If you put a witness up there that you knew was lying and you had evidence that was opposite of that. Okay, Hirschman said, I wrote the note. And Liz Cheney, like, this is part of it. This is part of their, it, none of this is accidental. It's all part of the teleprompter. Okay, that's what they do. So, so Hirschman previously told the committee, I wrote it. They said, well, we're going to say Cassidy wrote it. Okay. The handwritten note that Cassidy testified to was written by her. Let's see here. This, a spokesman for Hirschman told ABC News yesterday, Tuesday evening, says the handwritten note that Cassidy Hutchinson testified was written by her was in fact written by Eric Hirschman on January 6, 2021. And quote, the spokesperson for Hirschman says all sources with direct knowledge and law enforcement have and will confirm that it was written by Mr. Hirschman. Right. So, OK. And, and look, if I, if I as I said, if I just had to guess, yeah, that looks like a Hirschman note. Right. That looks like old Hershey. Let's see here. Let's zoom in on this a little bit. It, it looks like. It, that looks like a guy wrote that down. OK, I just have to say this now. All right. So I, I, would, I would I would say that it is probably true that it is his uh, the note, she says. That's a note I wrote at the direction of Mark Meadows, the chief of staff, around three o'clock. And it's written on the ch chief of staff's note card. But she says, that's my handwriting. Uh, nope, turns out maybe not true at all. Yeah, and they relied on her. Uh, yeah, here, the January 6th committee has repeatedly relied on Hirschman's candid and sometimes vulgar testimony throughout the hearings, including when he shot down Jeffrey Clark's plan to overturn the election, right? And he was also saying that, you know, yeah. So he was a, a very key witness. He was somebody who was integral to this whole process. I mean, they, they had him on repeat over and over and over again. Oh my gosh. And now it turns out uh, he wrote the note and that Miss Cassidy is uh, I don't know, maybe a liar or I don't know what the deal is. Now, there was a lot of pushback on this. And of course, the usual suspects come to defend her uh, because, I mean, that's really what this is. It's like a high school rally and the, uh, the, the, you know, the rival high school team is now being mean to their players. And so they're going to go out there and start defending their players here. This is Adam Kinzinger. He said this. He said to say Donald Trump is unfit for office would be an understatement. Cassidy Hutchinson's brave testimony today further solidified that for all Americans, those working overtime took uh, solidify that for all Americans, those working overtime to discredit her have the opportunity to come and testify under oath. We're here and we stand for truth. Okay, so that's really nice. Now, it's really nice that he says that, uh, I guess, if you want to, in, in other words, the standard here, okay, the, the committee has no obligation to vet the information that they present, okay? They just have to present it. And if you disagree with it, the burden of proof is on you to show opposite of this, right? Okay, in, in law, this is called burden shifting. Okay, one side has the burden of proof and they try to shift it over to the other side. So in, in, in a prosecutorial case, rather than saying that uh, the government has to prove that somebody committed a DUI, they're saying that we're just going to say that you committed the DUI and you have to disprove that you committed the DUI. Okay, and there are systems of government where that has happened and it's a disaster. It doesn't work well. And this happens all the time. Government prosecutors will try to shift the burden onto the defense and they'll say, you have to disprove the allegations. And we say, that's ridiculous. The burden exists with you. What's happening here is Kinzinger is doing that. He's saying she got up there and she sat there and she testified. And if you want to rebut her, you're free to come in here and testify under oath yourself. Well, Adam, uh, well, we, we'd like to cross-examine her. That would be one way to do it so that we could ask her questions. And so we could challenge all of these things in a way that might uncover the truth, but you're not allowing that. So what he's saying is now you have to come and I guess, uh, uh, you know, uh, placate yourself to the January 6th select committee, come in here and proselytize yourself at their, at their feet in order to get maybe an opportunity that they'll put some of your statements out there that they copy and paste from their depositions in a way that creates the narrative that suits their interests, right? Is that, is that the game that we're playing here? Nobody wants to come and testify in front of your fake committee here, dumb, dumb. No, thank you. First of all, the people testifying are not even testifying. 
they're they're answering very limited questions in between your book report chapters. Stupid. Okay, so here is uh, now she shift now little Adam Schiff pencil neck, who's looking a lot less pencil necky because he's putting on some weight over there. But here he was on MSNBC last night and Adam Kinzinger was you know, saying, hey, you're free to come in and testify. If you want to come in, come in here and set the record straight, come on in here and set the record straight. Nobody's stopping you. We're here for the truth. No, you're not. But anyways, so here on MSNBC, uh, pencil neck here, watermelon head, is now, is now going to be asked about this. You know, you're saying the Secret Service was assaulted by the president. Have you talked to them? Have they been cooperative to you? Are they going to come in and testify and clear any of this mess up? We've got questions. The Secret Service issued a statement tonight saying that they are fully cooperating Why is this not? with the committee and they will provide. Oh, it's only a one sided audio. I can't hear it. Wants. Is that a new posture for the Secret Service or have they been cooperating all along? Well, I Secret remember what Service he said. It's not though. monolithic, uh, so uh, some elements uh, might be cooperating, some might be refusing. But look, we are uh, interested in having anyone willing to come in that has relevant information uh, to come and share that information uh, under oath about what they saw, what they said, uh, and we would welcome uh, any uh, any testimony by relevant parties. Okay, so that's Adam Schiff. Now, sometimes when I clip these audios. The sound only comes through one channel. In this case, it must have been the left channel because I have my right earbud in. So I couldn't hear what he said. But I do remember this because I did watch this earlier. And I think he's talking about the Secret Service. He says they're not a monolith, right? They don't act the same way. And so we've gotten some usefulness from them and some non-usefulness from them. And so uh, it's hard to say, right? He's not going to come out and say the Secret Service has been very cooperative and forthcoming because it sounds like they have. I mean, they're saying, yeah, we're going to respond. We'd like to come in under oath. We've already come in under oath. We've given you all of our records. We've already testified. So yeah, we're being very cooperative. But if he says that, actually, yeah, they've uh, they've given us everything. Then, then the, the follow-up question is, well, what did they say about this saga? And if they didn't bring it up, why didn't they bring it up? And why are you just dropping this now without having confirmed this? Okay, why, why don't we hear this from Engel? Who was in the car? So he's just gonna, you know, hedge, right? It's all uh, they're not a monolith, and you know, we're trying to figure this out, but it's not not they they know, right? I think they know they stepped in it big time. And to illustrate that point, let's go up here to Miss uh, Raskin, Mr. Raskin here, who is uh, I think he gets a little bit agitated here on MSNBC. Let's check this one out. That crowd, which he then aimed uh, like a missile at the U.S. Capitol, and in fact, he wanted to lead that yeah. march up. Uh, to the Capitol, he wanted to be in there, and uh, that's what he became so irate about. And nobody's challenging that. Um, so, uh, so, so, do you see what's happening here? Nobody's challenging that. Okay. So, in other words, Miss Cassidy was at least like directionally accurate. All right. So, forget about the steering wheel thing. Is what he's saying. Forget about that. Doesn't matter. The steering wheel thing. It's not that big of a deal. It's kind of this little detail. You know. Forget it. The point is, is what, 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 this is clean up on aisle Democrat. Okay. They are like in panic mode. They realize their whole stinking hearing is shot, but they know now that they have to distance themselves from that little saga because it's not true, right? It's, it's inaccurate. And now it just pops the whole balloon here. And so he's going to say that it was directionally accurate. At least we know that Donald Trump's a maniac, you know, and he was probably screaming at somebody and he probably did want to go to the Capitol and maybe that's all true. But that's not assaulting a Secret Service agent, okay? And this is important because they're saying Trump is an unhinged lunatic. That's the narrative of this story. He didn't act appropriately. He fell below the standard of care of a president in a way that was criminal. And he now needs to be prosecuted and thrown out of American politics, along with all of his supporters and every Republican who ever voted for him. So Raskin is now going to change the story, okay? It's not about the, the assault on the clavicle anymore. It's now just about directionally Donald Trump's a maniac. You know, the, the, again, I, I fully expected that Ms. Hutchinson would come under attack, but uh, from my estimation, she spoke with entire credibility. See that? Entire credibility. Now, in my estimation, it's all true. But Adam, you know, right, what, what Mr. Hirschman sent to you. I mean, he told you that he wrote that note. So does that jeopardize your credibility at all? You interviewed Mr. Engel. 
And he didn't mention the assault on the Secret Service. Does that jeopardize her, cre her credibility at all? From my estimation, she spoke with entire credibility and authenticity yesterday. And we've, again, as I said, we've been focused on exactly what you just mentioned, the, the plot that day. But as you know, it's going to be used in certain quarters uh, as evidence that, well, now you can't believe anything she said if this story turns out not to be true. So is it your understanding? You've seen all the evidence. You've heard from witnesses. You've talked to the two people who are in this story. Mr. Renato and Mr. Engel, did that incident happen in the car? Did it happen? Raskin? Okay, I guess we lost Congressman Jamie Raskin. Uh, we lost on. his IFB there. Uh, so, oh. guys, obviously, Joe and Mika, this is her testimony. I'm not oh, wait, I thought we had that. Uh, oh, man, he didn't answer that question? <laughs> Sorry about that, everybody. That's a huge letdown. I clipped that. I thought he was going to answer that. Now, okay. So look at that. Isn't that convenient? Yeah. He his 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 earpiece cuts out right before the big question comes in. He's got to jump off the stage. Ah, what a joke. All right. So uh, you got the point of this, anyways. I mean, the point is, is that he's trying to distance himself from that. He finally gets the question: Did that happen? And his stinking earpiece comes out. Ah, ridiculous. All right. Now. He does get asked about this by Jake Tapper. So this one's pretty funny. This is a short one, I think 16 seconds. Uh, Ex-White House aide provides firsthand accounts of Trump's actions is what the uh, Chiron says. Tapper comes out and says, you know, this is all pretty much hearsay. Uh, like, could we get a little bit more substance here before we start unpacking this for America? Let's check this one out and watch Raskin at the end. This is it is just an incredibly damning and dramatic story uh, uh yeah. i would just as a journalist and as an american appreciate more corroboration for the story since Watch as Raskin. of now it is hearsay i mean it is oh sure somebody were <laughs> now i don't know where the rest of his answer goes All right this somebody clipped this off of uh twitter and so i just pulled it off there but here just as a journalist and as an american appreciate more corroboration for the story since as of now it is hearsay I mean, it is. Oh, sure. Somebody. Were yeah, yeah. It's 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 all nonsense, right? It's all nonsense. It, it, it's it's it, it irrelevant. Honestly, like the whole thing should just be discounted because there is no cross examination. Right? Anybody can just get up there and just say whatever they want if nobody's going to challenge them on it. Ridiculous. Now, speaking of Jake Tapper, I talked about this clip on one of our member morning walks actually this morning. This is a fascinating, fascinating clip. This is Boris Johnson and Jake Tapper. We just left Jake Tapper. Okay, Jake Tapper is a journalist. He wants more corroboration. He, he, I mean, he's like begging for more corroboration because that would make him feel better at night because he'd say, oh yeah, it really was a big problem. Right? You know, many people have been saying this is the end of American democracy for two years now, coming up on two years. And if it's not, right, you'd ex wouldn't you think that people would sort of feel a little bit foolish a little bit, you know, like they'd, they'd sort of learn from, no, nah, I guess not. I mean... We, we, we've had a lot of hyperventilating episodes here on this channel over the last two years. COVID, Ukraine, you know, every single time there's a tragedy in America, it's ultimate hyperventilation mode. Uh, women are now dropping dead out of airplanes from abortions or whatever. And, you know, it's just here, uh, the same story. We go back to January 6th. Jake Tapper now is, a, he, he's, he's going to do something very interesting here. He's going to say, you know, when I go around the world, everybody's talking about how America's on the verge of death. And, and my first question is, is that true, Jake? Like, does, does everybody really think that everything is on the verge of death? Or is this you who thinks that the world is on the verge of death? America's on the verge of death. But we're going to play through this because Boris Johnson is now going to be responding to Jake Tapper, who asks him, don't you think that January 6th is, is the end of America? And Boris Johnson repeatedly poo-poos that idea. Let's watch. We're here at the G7 a gathering of the world's leading democracies. When I talk to friends in Canada, the UK, Australia, and elsewhere, people express concern about the United States as... The United States. About the United States in terms of our ability and our institutions to, to thrive and continue after what happened uh, with the election of 2020. They worry that democracy is on life support in the United States. People might not know this about you, but you were born. In so I want to back up just a little bit on this because watch Boris Johnson's reaction. He, he, he sort of goes, America, what? Really? Wow. Like, watch, Canada, watch. Canada, the UK, Australia, and elsewhere. People express concern about the United States. Watch him. As the United States. The United, the United States? States? What? In terms of our ability and our institutions to, 
to thrive and continue I'm after talking what about. happened uh, with the election of 2020. They worry that democracy is on life support in the United States. People might not know this about you, but you were born in the United States and until recently you I was. And I, uh, I was. I was. I was born in New York City. Uh, uh, was a, a fantastic place. Jake, uh, where, where, were you born? You where were you born in New York? Where was uh, Staten Island. All right. Okay. I was, like, I was born in New York General Hospital. Remember, anyway. Are you worried at all? Do you look No. At, I want to say this to the people of the United States. I'm not. No. Uh, I think that, I, I just get back to the, what I've been trying to say to you uh, throughout this interview. Uh, I think that uh, reports of the death of democracy in the United States are grossly, grossly exaggerated. Uh, America is a shining city on a hill. And for me, for my, and it will continue to be so. And I think that uh, the mere fact that uh, you know, Joe Biden has stepped up to the plate in the way that, uh, that he has uh, shows that the instincts of America are still very much in the right place. And, yeah, look, I mean, there were, there were some uh, weird and, and kind of unattractive scenes uh, back in the, you know. Died. I mean, that, it was pretty it was serious. Pretty, it was pretty weird. Now watch, Jake. I, I won't. I won't deny that. Looking, weird. I mean, looking from the outside, <laughs> it was pretty weird. But I don't believe that. Oh, American we're going to watch this again. Democracy is under serious threat. Far from it. <laughs> I continue to believe that America is the greatest global guarantor of democracy and freedom. Okay. So, did you hear that word that he used, man? I, I got a kick out of that word. I think it's a perfect word. And look, I don't listen to a lot of Boris Johnson over, you know, from here in the United States. So, you know, he's, he's, he, he comes up with, with some of his, you know, scandalous stuff, whatever's going on over there. Uh, but, you know, it's a perfect word. He said, what happened on January 6th was pretty weird. Yeah, it was pretty weird. And Jake Tapper doesn't like that answer. He goes, what? Hey, it was more than weird, Boris. America was hanging by a thread because they almost got the podium. And Boris Johnson, he, he, he triples down on that, okay? He says weird three times. He says, yeah, I mean, there were some weird and ugly scenes, whatever, and more than weird. And he's, yeah, it was pretty weird. He said, well, people died. I, yeah, it was, it was weird. And Jake Tapper, it's like, who are you talking about, buddy? Are you talking about Ashley Babbitt or Miss Boyland? You talking about them who died? Because right, it wasn't Brian Sicknick. He died of natural causes, you liar. You know that. So let's listen to this one more time because Boris Johnson, he, 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 he says weird three times and Jake Tapper is just like, doesn't believe it. And this has to be embarrassing as hell for him. I mean, it's like, it's like, guys, somebody else is calling you on your nonsense. Stop hyperventilating. America is not hanging by a thread, you idiots. It's not about the podium or feet on Nancy Pelosi's desk. We're going to be okay. Uh, America is a shining city on a hill. And for me, for my, and it will continue to be so. And I think that uh, the mere fact that uh, you know, Joe Biden has stepped up to the plate in the way that, uh, that he has uh, shows that the instincts of America are still very much in the right place. And yeah, look, I mean, there were, there were some uh, weird and, and kind of unattractive scenes uh, back Watch in the- Watch Jake, you know, died. I mean, it was pretty it was serious. Pretty, it was pretty weird. I, I, won't, I won't deny that. It was that. weird. I mean, looking from the outside, it was pretty weird. But I don't <laughs> believe that American <laughs> democracy is uh, under serious threat. Far from it. Uh, I continue to believe that America is... Poor Jake. Where's the body language crew? Look at him. I and mean, he's like so uncut. Well, it's more than weird here. From the outside, you know, this is like, this is like, I don't know. You know, it sort of reminds me of it, it reminds me of like a social situation where somebody comes and like they make something like into a big deal, you know, and you just kind of go, really? And then the person goes, oh, yeah, I guess you're right. I guess it really wasn't that big of a deal. You know, I kind of feel foolish. Like I've done that many times. Like I'll, I'll go to somebody. I'll say, I've got this giant catastrophic problem. Can you help me? And they say, well, how about that? And you go, oh, yeah, I guess I guess I was being a big stinking baby. And I guess I should have just changed my diaper about it before I started complaining and hyperventilating about something for 17 months. But I wonder if Jake Tapper is going to get that message. Uh, probably not. But I think right, weird is kind of the perfect word, right? It's weird. It was a weird thing that happened. I have a lot of questions about the weirdness on January 6th. A lot of questions about the uh, pipe bomber. What happened to him? Don't know. What happened to the, the actual security at the Capitol on that day? Who gave the order for the police officers to tap shoulders and let the, the protesters in? I mean, 
a lot of questions about this. Why did Muriel Bowser deny National Guard support on January 5th? Why did the Senate and the House Sergeant at Arms deny Stephen Sund his specific request from the Capitol Hill police? Why? I got a lot of questions. It was very, very weird indeed. Now, uh, some people might speculate that it was allowed to happen or it might have been encouraged to happen. And uh, maybe people would say that something like that would be very useful to expelling all of your political opponents. And AOC is a good example of that. She wants all of the Republicans thrown out on their butts because this has been a war to marginalize all of the, well, the political opponents of the Democrats. Here is AOC who is going to be uh, communicating this with Stephen Colbert, which is very interesting here. This is a pretty, I, I didn't catch this. I didn't know she was on Stephen's show. But Stephen, of course, uh, almost insurrected America with his own late night hosts. And so my question to AOC would be, you know, they committed crimes at the Capitol building too, at the Capitol uh, offices, okay? Not in the building, but in the offices that con are connected to the tunnels. So I wonder if she would support the Republicans forming their own committee to go and investigate Stephen. Legal thing to do. Okay, the pardon power is a legal presidential power, and she's saying they should be expelled. Okay, so like, uh, let's 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 finish this. I don't know if she's saying that her party should throw them out or if the voters should throw them out because the voters have that option. Okay, one of the checks and balances that exists in our democratic republic is the voting booth. Theoretically, you're supposed to go in there and be able to you know throw out bad people and have legitimate elections and all of that. And so that is one lever of power, right? You don't have to have the strong arm of the government responsible for exercising you know, every area of, of, of control, but let's listen to see what she has to say. Is, I guess, worthy of acknowledgement of a crime. Oh my gosh, she's so painful. I don't even know why I clip her for this show. Let's forget about her. Here is Megyn Kelly. Okay, here's Megyn Kelly now. Megyn Kelly, uh, now I, I wanted to clip from her because Megyn Kelly has a big history with Donald Trump. She says that Donald Trump uh, well, let's listen to her. I think, I think this is a good clip from her. And I, I like Megyn Kelly's perspective on this because remember, she has a lot of history with Donald Trump. She was the, the person at that first debate that Donald Trump, you know, got that question. I mean, and this, this, this was a monumental event. Megyn Kelly asked Donald Trump about his language towards women. Remember? And it was like the first debate ever. And Donald Trump was sort of in the center space. He had the highest number of, it was polling the highest. And the first question was pretty tough for Megan. And she came out and she said, you know, you've used bad language about Rosie O'Donnell, calling her a fat pig, whatever. And Donald Trump, I mean, I got to tell you this, and I've commented on this before. His answer at that moment was one of the most incredible answers. I think it probably like solidified the primaries. He said, only Rosie O'Donnell. Right. And it was a funny response and it took the air out of the room. The whole room burst out laughing and it was like an acknowledgement. He said, uh, only Rosie O'Donnell. And then he said, yes, yes, I know. I use, I use some bad language or whatever. Like, yes, I know. And he moved on with it. Now that turned into a, a big thing the next day. And I thought that that was sort of a fine interchange, but Trump said the next day, you know, that she had blood coming out of her wherever. And that hit the media and it was sort of a woman, you know, menstruation joke. And it was, you know, it, it became a big story and it turned into this big saga. And, you know, Megyn Kelly, of course, has uh, left Fox News and she's now has her own show. And here is what she said about this today. And I wanted to sort of get her take on this. She's also a brilliant lawyer and she went to, I think, Duke University. I mean, she's you know brilliant. So let's listen to her. None of this reflects well on Donald Trump. Does anyone think January 6th reflects well on Trump? But there's no need to pretend that this is some earth shattering game changer. Yes, It's yesterday. additional flavor on an already cooked meal. Yep. The attempt to claim otherwise comes from people who already loathed Trump. I actually think I'm in a unique spot. On you are. Front. You are. I feel no need to defend Trump or his character, as my audience knows. We do. But I know a sham trial when I see one. And this is not justice. It is not fair. And it is not to be trusted. Boom, right? Not to be trusted. Even people who have no love for Donald Trump are out there saying this is a garbage garbage sham trial. That is Megyn Kelly. And of course she is dead right about that. So that was some of the response to Miss Cassidy Hutchinson. And I think this is just really, really bad for this uh, committee. And you can tell because they're all in a uh, panic mode, sort of, you know, <clears throat> trying to say it was a non-consequential one little variable of a much broader 
line of questioning. So that is Cassidy Hutchinson. Now we also have some J6 updates because Steve Bannon and some of the process crime victims are also in court. We saw two things happen today that I wanted to cover. First, <clears throat> first let's talk about the, the, the Proud Boys case, okay? Because this one's pretty quick. Now, the Proud Boys, there are a number of different defendants that came out, and I wanted to share with you this updated filing today. So you can see a big minute, and, and minute order came out. What happened is, <clears throat> in the Proud Boys case, because there are so many defendants, the government prosecutors have given them a bunch of discovery, disclosure, right? Evidence. We've got video footage. We've got deposition testimony. We've got a bunch of stuff. And it's a lot. So what the Proud Boys did is in one of their prior motions, they submitted a request over to the court and they say, judge, they gave us so much stuff. They gave us boxes of documents like bins and, you know, and it's like wheelbarrows full of stuff. Your honor, we need some help parsing through this because we are not the DOJ. Okay. We have not had 17 months to prosecute these crimes. We are people who have limited means. Our lawyers don't have all of the funds necessary in order to you know, support our efforts. And we need help. We want the government to identify for us <clears throat> some of the, some of the exculpatory evidence. Okay. So remember that Brady material in law is material that tends to show a defendant might be innocent. It's exculpatory. And because the government has all of the evidence, they need to disclose that to the defense. If we don't have that, then we are not able to do our job because they've got the evidence and they can spring something up and we can't see that actually that officer lied or that that witness was actually the person who was there at the scene, not our client, right? We need all of this information. And when there's a ton of it, like if the government tries to bury the defense in discovery, like thousands and thousands or tens of thousands of pages or thousands of hours of discovery, sometimes what you can do as a defense is say, judge, right? What they're trying to do is gain an advantage. They're trying to use the discovery rules to take advantage of the defense. And so your honor, what we'd like you to do is, is make them tell us where the exculpatory material is, right? They can't just bury us in documents. So here the Proud Boys tried to get the government to identify this material. They submitted a motion, hey, tell, the, tell those prosecutors to give us the material or tell us where it is. And the court came out today, yesterday, and said, denied. Sorry, Proud Boys. Your motion for an order that directs the government to identify the Brady material is denied. And they go back to the case in Brady, came out in 1963. They say the government, quote, has an affirmative duty. This is the Brady rule, an affirmative duty to disclose exculpatory evidence to the defense, even if no request has been made by the accused, right? It's a general rule. And they say that the government has no duty to direct a defendant to exculpatory evidence within a mass of undisclosed evidence, right? So if we're going to deliver this wheelbarrow of discovery over to you, we don't necessarily uh, have to identify where in the wheelbarrow that exculpatory material is. Nordine seeks an exception to this general rule saying, we want you to identify in the wheelbarrow where the exculpatory material is. Why? They're asking the court to order the government to identify it. They say it's a departure from the norm. Yeah, but it's not unheard of. They say in certain circumstances and acting under their discretionary authority, some courts have required prosecutors to disclose this. And no one denies in this case, that they're dealing with an extraordinary amount of discovery, right? All of the Proud Boys, <clears throat> lots of discovery. Nonetheless, the judge says at this time, the court does not find an order appropriate. So we're not going to make the, the government identify all of the discovery that might be exculpatory, even though they're telling us that, yes, it is indeed voluminous. This is not a case in which the government has dumped millions of files on the defendant, provided him no help in sorting through them, and then told him to find a needle in the haystack. Judge says the government here has provided three categories of discovery, stuff that's case specific, cross discovery and global discovery. And so all of this, they say, while the latter category in the global discovery phase, right? So in other words, there are three buckets. One bucket is specific to the defendant in the case. Another bucket is like cross discovery for maybe co-defendants. And then finally, we just have like everything, right? Everything that is available. That's in the, the global bucket. They say, yeah, there is an exceptionally large amount of material in there. The government, though, has provided a searchable index and they provided material on searchable platforms. 
even if the parties debate how well the platforms work, right? So the defense now is saying, yeah, they gave us this garbage database, but we can't even use it. And the judge says, well, that's good enough. Like they've done their job. In other words, Nordine, the Proud Boys and his co-defendants should have a roadmap to have all the videos that were captured. And finally, to the extent that the motion is predicated on a lack of manpower to review the discovery. In other words, we, we are just a couple of defendants here with like maybe a lawyer or two. The U.S. Department of Justice, they've got billions of dollars and hundreds, if not thousands, thousands of lawyers. Okay. The court made clear that it's open to discussing the need to authorize more resources for the defense. So the judge is saying, if you need more help, submit a request, give us some money, and then maybe we, maybe we can get you some more help. In the end, though, it may be that all of the above is insufficient from the defense perspective. And so the motion may be renewed. So let me know. But for now, the court's going to provide no Nordine and his co-defendants the opportunity to use the above tools if necessary. You know, you can ask for more money, get some more public defenders appointed to the case or whatever. <clears throat> but I'm not going to order the prosecutors to go out and pick that, that discovery for you, right? So it, it really puts the defense at a disadvantage because they may not have that same manpower and the government doesn't have to uh, properly just, you know, to basically pinpoint that stuff any further. So that's what the Proud Boys. Now let's leave, let's wrap up with Bannon because Bannon had a very interesting motion that he filed a couple days ago and the prosecutors responded today and I have all that broken out here. So for a quick recap, remember that Steve Bannon is charged with a process crime here. You know, he was not there on January 6th. He's not charged with trespassing. He's not charged with anything that, you know, uh, resembles an actual crime. He's charged with contempt of Congress because he did not show up to this fake January 6th select committee garbage hearing and give them testimony or provide them with any documents. And so what this means is that he's now charged with a crime. His trial is coming up, my friends, super duper soon. And in fact, holy moly, I forgot. It looks like jury selection. I think the voir dire questionnaires go out tomorrow. Yeah, so I think it starts on June 30th. In other words, <clears throat> they're going to start sending the letters out, I believe. Let's, is that right? What's going on here? Yeah, jury selection trial set to commence on 718 is when jury selection starts. So I think what's happening is the, uh, I think we might get an update tomorrow that there's jury, uh, questions that might be jury questions or do jury questions due by tomorrow <clears throat> so for void deer and all of that stuff i think that's what's going on but anyways point is trial is coming up and now we're at a status where the bannon defense is saying we need more evidence so what they filed two days ago on 627 and the government prosecutors just responded to this today is it's called a motion to compel and you can see it's got a bunch of different exhibits on here but let's just piece together what's happening here. Okay, so the motion to compel filed by Steve Bannon, and I have that document, but I want to show you some of these other documents briefly. <clears throat> these are the exhibits before we actually dive into the motion. So what happened is Steve Bannon and his defense team, they said to the January 6th committee, they said here uh, on June 21st, they say, dear counsel, uh, and they're writing this to the government prosecutor. Okay, so this is going to Amanda Vaughn. A couple, about a week ago, they say, Miss Vaughn, government prosecutor, we write to request memoranda and other things about your decision not to charge Mark Meadows and Dan Scavino. Okay, so I want that material. I think it's relevant. Why? Because this is important. Judge Nichols said this on March 16th. I grant defendant's motion to get statements about all of that stuff. Okay, so he says, I want the material. Can you please send it over to me, Amanda Vaughn? Then, it looks like that request is denied by Amanda Vaughn. Amanda Vaughn responds and says, no, sorry, uh, here, uh, not gonna give that to you. Says, Mr. Lawyer for Steve Bannon, we write in response to your letter saying that you want all memoranda. To date, we've given you all of the discovery that we have to under our obligations. We've given you more material from Judge Nichols on March 16th. And by the way, uh, we have nothing to provide in response to your request that is discoverable under our obligations. So we don't have to give you anything anyways. Don't have to tell you anything. And, uh, and we're not going to give it to you. So then they said, well, Judge Nichols said, we get it. And you say, we don't get it. Well, that's a big problem. So then they draft this letter. They send this one over and they say <clears throat> uh, to Mr. Scott Gass, 
This is Justin. Oh, so this is just another letter that he's referencing. So we don't actually have to dig into that. Uh, Trump lawyer sent. So this is another letter that went over to Jerry Nadler back on September 19th. And then here is another lawsuit from Mark Meadows versus Nancy Pelosi. So just so we can see what we're talking about as we go through the actual motion to compel. Okay. Now here this is actually I pulled it up here so that we can mark it up. This is the motion to compel that as we saw earlier is being filed in the case against Steve Bannon. It's 17 pages long. It's got all of those exhibits that we just looked at and it was filed two days ago. The government prosecutors have also responded and we'll take a quick look at their response. But here they're saying, look, judge, we've got a problem here. We have asked for discovery material and they're not giving it to us. Mr. Bannon has requested the production of this material and the government counsel is refusing to provide it. This motion and the focus here is that the material at issue should not in any way deemed a withdrawal or a waiver of the request for compelling. So basically they're saying that we need this. The government is not getting it to us. And judge, we're asking you to force them to give it to us, compel them to disclose it to us. And the defense lawyer for Bannon writes, recent media reports have indicated that following the receipt of a criminal contempt referral from the House of Representatives, Mark Meadows and Dan Scavino and their refusal to comply, they formally declined to bring charges against either man, right? The news is reporting no charges for Meadows, no charges for Scavino, but we got charges for Bannon and Navarro and others. So they want to know why the January 6th committee didn't file the charges or decided decline charges against those other two people. January 6th committee members have questioned the decision. Even they disagree with this, indicating that they do not understand there to be a material distinction based on the relevant Office of Legal Counsel opinions between these individuals and Mr. Bannon, who faces charges. So the defense is saying, OK, well, I need to know now why my client is being charged if these other clients are not being charged. It's very similar conduct. OK, they, they were doing similar things. And so. As a defense lawyer, what's the rub here? Why charge one person for similar conduct and not another? So in light of those reports, on June 21st, Bannon's lawyers, the undersigned, wrote to the prosecutors in the case and they requested a copy of the declination letters regarding Meadows and Scavino. OK, we decline to charge you because of the following. Now, oftentimes these things will just say, you know, uh, it's very bland. It, it'll say something like no likelihood of conviction. Right. A declination letter. We've reviewed the facts of the case and we, we've uh, analyzed it, applied the applicable law. And we've decided that based on the facts presented, the likelihood of conviction is low or there is no likelihood of conviction. Therefore, no referral. It's a declination letter. It's on record. We've, you've spent all this time investigating these people. You've opened files on Meadows and Scavino. You've got deposition files right on them. So why not charge them? What's the decision? Mark your file. OK, <clears throat> so they want copies of those along with the related materials on the decision concerning whether or not to prosecute Meadows and Scavino, both of whom relied on the invocation of executive privilege by Trump for their noncompliance, which is the same thing that Bannon is relying on. Later on June 21st, government counsel wrote back advising that they've already exceeded their obligations. We've already given you everything you guys need over there. You don't actually need that stuff. So apparently they say, the motion follows from the government's refusal to provide the requested materials. Now, judge, we asked nicely, but now we need you to order it to happen. And you can see some of these articles they're referencing U.S. News, Axios, New York Times. And it says Justice Department opts not to charge Meadows and Scavino. So why are they charging Bannon and Navarro? We want those declination letters. Apparently, the New York Times has been provided a copy of the declination letters. And based on their reporting, it might well be that the letters reflecting the decision not to prosecute were summary notices without much, if any, analysis provided. However, even if that were the case, Mr. Bannon respectfully requests these materials, and we think that they are discoverable under the court's orders and under Brady and Giglio materials. So even if it is just a quick sentence that says uh, no referral, dec uh, we decline to prosecute because of no likelihood of conviction, I still want to see that. And we have a, a subsection here. It says all of Meadows and Scavino's declination materials constitute the official position of the DOJ and they must be produced under the court's order. Right. And they reference this again. 
The judge said back on March 16th, said specifically, I will grant the defendant's motion to the extent it requests statements or writings reflecting official DOJ policy, like the opinion of the Office of Legal Counsel to litigate whether those statements are public or not, if those writings relate to the department's policy on prosecuting or not prosecuting government officials. Okay, so it sounds like that is within the purview of this. The Meadows and Scavino declination letters and the related materials fall squarely within the court's order, requiring the government to produce these things. Both men were government officials or former government officials. Executive privilege was invoked by President Trump through his counsel, Justin Clark, in the same way that it was in the other cases. Therefore, materials sought through this motion to compel our official writings and the DOJ should hand them over. The Meadows and Scavino materials must be independently produced, this says, as the court is aware. The fundamental feature of Bannon's defense theory is that he is entitled to the defense of entrapment by estoppel based on his reliance from the government. And okay, what this is saying is part of Bannon's defense is, he, is he's saying, look, when I decided not to show up to this fake hearing and this fake committee, part of that was because I was relying on their guidance. The Office of Legal Counsel, right, they've got memos, they've got departmental memoranda that say this is how we do things and if the executive branch invokes privilege then us at the doj we don't you know we do things this way when that happens and so what bannon is saying is uh i, I followed their guidance they said that they were going to do this if i did this and if, if the president invokes and so i that's what i was relying on that's why i didn't show up so now you can't charge me with the crime department of justice for following your own policies it's ridiculous. So you should be stopped from prosecuting me. You can't prosecute me. In support of one of his defenses, Bannon has, of course, asserted that based on the clearly expressed and repeatedly reiterated rationale for the positions taken over there, there is no legal basis for distinguishing between the former and the current executive branch officials as private citizens. Okay, so maybe that's the distinction there. Maybe they're only prosecuting Bannon and Navarro because they are, quote, private citizens. At the, They were private citizens at the time that J6 occurred. But if, whereas Scavino and Meadows were not, right? They were actually in the government. So if that's the distinction he's saying here, that's not an appropriate legal distinction. Okay, you don't get to charge somebody with a crime based on that distinction because he's saying that legally the invocation of the executive privilege extends all the way beyond that. And he wants to be able to make that argument. The clearly expressed rationale underlying each relevant OLC opinion and other writings goes back six decades. And we've covered a lot of that here, right? We've covered, they, they had a whole big lit, litany of documents and you can see they're referencing a lot of them here. 1984, we've covered all of this. I'm not gonna spend time on it here. Not one of these clearly expressed rationale applies with any less force to private citizens. So if they're going to say we can prosecute Bannon because he's a private citizen or was at the time, he's saying that the, D, the DOJ policy does not make that distinction. He says there's no rational basis for drawing a legal distinction based on the status of the witness vis-a-vis -vis their rights, duties, and obligations to a congressional sub subpoena. And he's referencing this, right, uh, subsection 13. He says this comes from a DOJ document. It, that was written back on June 27, 2007, referencing the assertion of executive privilege concerning the dismissal of U.S. attorneys. Okay, executive privilege and U.S. attorneys. And so these are our policies. The defense rights for Bannon, even more to the point here, it is perfectly reasonable for a person in Bannon's situation who reads these opinions and the rationale expressed in all of them, together with all of the other writings, to have believed that the opinions authorized his conduct okay he was able to read those opinions and come to his conclusion this is even more true true in light of an additional opinion which supports him even further and one must completely ignore the rationale behind the opinions if we're just going to say there's no distinction between private citizens so you can see this is why it's so important to see why did you not charge them why if it's because they're private he's saying i got a whole stinking book of legal arguments that i'm about to throw your way that shows why even in this case, Bannon should not be prosecuted. So now he's talking about the distinctions here between Meadows and Pelosi. He gives us some legal argument, which of course will fly through most of this because a lot of this is just some heavy. Uh, when, you see, when you see all of these italicized uh, uh, 
case names here, right? Basically what we're seeing, this is all what we call rules in the law. And so a lot of these, the way that we structure a lot of legal opinions in the law is you have what's called the Iraq format, not like the Middle East that was a war zone, although the Iraq in law can be a war zone, but it's issue, rule, analysis, and conclusion. And so a lot of this is sort of the rule section. They're saying, this is where I'm getting my case law upon which I'm saying, judge, you should grant my motion. And he, and he references it. So we can fast forward through a lot of it because it's sort of, well, it's copy and paste from other cases in case law. And so he's got his rules laid out there. He says, based on the foregoing, Bannon respectfully submits the court, grant the motion and order the government to produce those requested materials signed off on by all of the attorneys, of course, that we've been following along. And that is the motion. Here is the order. They want the judge to come in here and sign this and say, Carl J. Nichols, granted. Upon consideration of the order, the defense motion to compel the discovery materials is granted. And now we're going to have to wait and see if the judge ultimately does that. <clears throat> and we'll have to see. Now, that was the ban in motion. Now we'll get out of this one. The government prosecutors responded. We'll just do a quick snapshot of what this looks like. And then we'll take a look at your uh, comments and questions and your super chats and all this stuff. So this is the opposition to the motion. They're saying, no, judge, well, we have already provided everything. He's wrong on both counts. None of this is official DOJ policy. No records exist. Uh, in connection, basically they're saying we don't have anything. No records exist in connection with the consideration of contempt referrals for Mark Meadows. So we don't have anything to give you is what that's their argument. And the government has never understood the court to have required the government to provide internal analysis and attorney work product material related to its decision-making process anyways. And so they're saying that, first of all, we don't have anything. And even if we did judge, we shouldn't have to give it over to you guys because it is our work product. You know, we don't have to really disclose any of that. So the judge is going to have to go back to his art order from March and we'll see. This is Judge Nichols. We'll have to see what he has to say about this. And, uh, you know, trial is right around the corner. So we'll get some rulings on this uh, relatively soon. If he's if he grants it. Well, now we've got new discovery. And so they're going to have to process that quickly because trial is coming up. And we, of course, we are going to cover that. Uh, in one way, shape or form, I'm not sure exactly how we're going to do it yet. If we're going to do the transcript thing or the something else, but it should be a lot of fun and we are going to get to that. But now it is time to hear from you, my friends. And so let's do that. Here is uh, our first one. Actually, that didn't work out. I don't know what, what that was all about. All right. So back here on locals, we'll start here today. And when I scroll down to the bottom here, see Rose. I'm not sure what, what uh, what's going on with my locals here. C Rose says, I agree with you. Actually, no, this is the comment. What kind of committee is this? Where's Trump's legal counsel? This is from C Rose. Uh, well, I don't know where they're at. I mean, I don't know. He says, this is just a sh sham trial to air on the news and the new evidence to make Trump look bad. This is like a land, a, a live grand jury hearing. By the way, nothing hurt America's image of democracy as much as the 2020 summer of love in this humble foreigner's perspective. P.S., can, can you host a poll of your locals videos to see if they should be titled walking in Arizona? I think it will catch on. Enjoy your evening and thanks for the show. Well, thank you, C. Rose. Yeah, so I walk around Arizona, uh, sort of downtown Phoenix, and it is a beautiful, beautiful area where I walk around. And so he, I think he's saying that maybe it's, I should call it walking in Arizona because people don't know what Arizona looks like. It's not a bad idea. The Antica says, by the way, Rob, what I meant by you being late in Ricada is that if you're going to keep being late, your nose is going to start growing. I don't know what those other ones are about. It's not like mods are inherently hmm or something. No, of course not. And uh, West Star Lee says keck, <laughs> which is, uh, of course, it, it is a keckable comment. There's no question about that. So shout out to Vientikus. Three Girlies is here, says, I'm putting this here just in case. I still have question on the J6ers. Thank you, Heather. I, I didn't remember to go get it. So thank you. Can the J6ers appeal on the ground that they didn't have discovery that is being held by the J6 commission? Uh, so it's so a great question. Does it matter if they pled guilty or no contest versus not guilty? Also, if the BLM, Antifa, Jane, Revenge, et cetera, protesters actually get arrested for rioting on a federal level or are charged federally, can the J6ers use the BLM, Antifa, Jane's Revenge, et cetera, cases to help their cases like sentencing? Could the J6ers argue their sentencing 
is more severe than the BLM or Antifa sentences? And yes, so yes, great question, Heather. And the the mechanism in the law that allows for this, and let me see if there's anything good on this, it's called post-conviction relief. And it's a very important area of the law that allows, now these aren't good, good links. I wanted to see if there was sort of a, yeah, here. So like the American Bar Association has a good link. Well, it's kind of a good link on it. Let's see here. Okay, I'm just going to explain it because this is a lot. All right, so uh, post-conviction relief is, it's different than an appeal. After a trial is concluded, after you enter a guilty plea, there's nothing to appeal, right? You agreed to that. You say, okay, I, I agree. I, you know, I enter into this. I can't appeal it. But if you go and you lose a trial, then you can appeal, right? Because, or you lose a hearing, an evidentiary hearing. And so you do have the right to appeal, but that is very limited in time. And it's 14 days really for most issues in most states to appeal. And if you wait outside the 14 days, you lose the opportunity to do that. So in these cases, okay, what happens now? You have some of these people who pled guilty, so they can't appeal. Well, the law has what's called a, a petition for a post-conviction relief, which allows you to then say, we've discovered new things, material things that change what we would have done. So a good example of this would be like, uh, it just, it, it, let, let's, let's, the, the, the J6 stuff gets overly complicated, but let's say this is just a simple shoplifting case. Okay. Some officer says that this person stole this thing. It's a, he said, she said word, go to trial. The defendant loses or the defendant pleads guilty or whatever. And we fast forward a few months, that officer gets fired from the department and he's investigated for making up crimes. Happens all the time, right? They just made up evidence. They inserted evidence or whatever. Now we learn about that and we say, you know, we didn't know that. And we think that that might be a problem in our case. And so we want to investigate this and we investigate it. And we find out there was in fact a problem and we file a petition for post-conviction relief. And we say, had we known that this officer was committing all these crimes, we would have never pled guilty. We'd have never gone to trial or maybe we would have gone to trial or whatever the situation is. And so, uh, yeah, actually there is a mechanism for this. And Part of the reason why the prosecutors wanted to agree to continuances for the Proud Boys or the Oath Keepers, I believe it was one of the two, is because they, they didn't want this to come back to bite them in the butt. Okay, what happens if they go to trial and lose or win or they plead guilty and new evidence comes out from the committee? They might have to reopen a bunch of cases. Here's another one from former LEO, says Bongino did a good job on this. He's a great resource. He said that she was told by the Secret Service there was a problem with POTUS and the Beast but they weren't in the beast, they were in an SUV. He says it's a sham upon a shame upon a sham. All made up by the press from former LEO. He says, I do watching the watchers on locals because it's $5 a month. I'm on a fixed income because I'm disabled and raising two girlies. If it was much higher, I wouldn't be able to afford it either. I really appreciate you making it available for other people who do struggle on a fixed income. Thank you for sharing that with me, three girlies. Uh... Thank you for sharing that with me, three girlies. Yeah. I appreciate you being here, three girlies. And I know it is, I know times are tough. I'm, gr I'm grateful that you're here. Shout out to the other two girlies. Here we have former LEO. And I know that other people are raising some of their prices and things like that. And I know that times are tight. I'm grateful that you're here. I just want to say that. So former LEO says, Rob, I first year equity admission law student could dis a first year equity law school school, school student could dismember her. She gave two prior videotape depots with no disclosure of the incident. Rob, please let me impeach your testimony. Please, 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 please. From former LEO. <laughs> Go for it, former LEO. I, you could destroy her. Yes, you're an officer. You know how this goes. You've been cross-examined. Thunder Seven says, Funny how Cassidy was so afraid and in fear about the J6 claims that Trump attacked his Secret Service agents and yanked the steering wheel, yet she begged the White House to take her along to Florida when Trump moved his office there. The woman is seriously delusional. If she believes her testimony has any credibility, and it's really pathetic how desperate the rhino trader Cheney is. Good thing is that the public realize how dishonest and corrupt this J6 Stalin trial really is. Good to see you here, Thunder7. Says, Rob, serious question, even though it's not a real court. Can Cassidy be charged with perjury? Yes. Yeah, right. She's, she put her hand up. Swore. Yes. 
She can be, and she probably should be if she lied. She's already been proven to have lied, so are there any consequences? It depends if the Republicans get back in charge. Three Girlie says, did I miss the question? Did you ever ask Agent Angle or the other, other agent if it was true? Instead, they wanted a classic denial straight off the top, like as if it was the agent's job to issue a denial right then and there. It's not really right. That's ridiculous. It's gossip. And who has to categorically deny gossip right then and there? Right? They don't. Maybe she didn't need to know because she wasn't there. I don't hear Liz asking her if she ever asked him if it was true. It just sounded like a gossip mill. It was. It was a game of telephone, three girlies. Oh my gosh. We have a a love chat bot. That's interesting. Okay, Vientica says, this is all REO Speedwagon style testimony. <laughs> JC the Music Man, Jeremy Matridas here says, Hutchinson was originally told to say he grabbed the medial end of the clavicle when observed from the cephalod position, but she could only remember the word clavicle. What normal person says clavicle besides maybe a doctor? I know it's a good point. You say shoulder, right? Grabbing by the shoulder. But the clavicle, you know, I think it, doesn't it break under like seven pounds of pressure or something like that? Jeremy says, Rob, your comment that she looked like she was about to burst out laughing. That was my thought exactly. Her face was, I'm telling a fib written all over it. Just like, kind of one of those faces. Here, Heather and, and uh, Mr. MVP are chatting away. It's Jake from Oxford. Oh gosh, let's see what this is about. Rob, Please allow me to give you information and your doubting viewers some behind the curtains information. Ooh, see, I told you, this is an amazing community. He says, this is so serious. You guys have no idea how close democracy was to falling. While I'm the lemo, while in the lemo, Trump was accompanied by a special bodyguard he called the T-1000. Horace from Terminator 2. They had in possession a weapon called the Death Star ugh, that made nukes look like a nine millimeter. The Secret Service agent said that Trump almost looked him out. Luckily, the Eye of the Tiger began playing over the radio, which gave the agent the boost he needed to take on the 70-year-old man. And then Bruce Willis showed up and helped finish off the T-1000. It was so crazy, I can't wait to show you the surveillance video. <laughs> look, it's true. I, I saw that, too. I, did, did you Look, the, the one thing, Jake, that, that you missed, Rambo was there, too. Rambo, he repelled out of a helicopter and Arnold Schwarzenegger was in a tank and that's how they stopped Trump from seizing America. The A-team was there. Okay, it's, it's a better story. Yeah, Mr. MVP says that's a much more interesting story. That's what Cassidy Hutchinson should have said. They should have told this story, not her fake story. One tough chick says, Cassidy using the phrase something to the effect of frequently. Seems like a conscious choice of words. Is there a benefit to using that phrase as a precursor to the statement? Anytime she speaks, it's like nails on a chalkboard. No, that's a terrible thing to say if you're testifying. Nobody cares about the effect of. People want to know what. Okay, like if she was... If she was being cross-examined, it would be like, yes or no, right? Like, yes or no. Like, did that happen? Yes or no. Not to the effect of, not close. Yes or no. And, of course, we don't get that. R Former LEO says, could the J6 hoax committee be persecuted, prosecuted as a RICO violation on ongoing criminal enterprise? No. Well, the DOJ would have to prosecute them, and they, they run the DOJ. So the answer is no. Ed says, I do not understand why a simple handwriting sample would not have been done by the sham committee. Are they really that dumb? Yes. I'm wondering if it wasn't the witness that rushed everything to avoid being found out. Maybe she wanted her shot at Trump for not hiring her. I think there's truth to that. I, I, they're high on their own supply. That's the, that's the real takeaway. Former says, so I could test a lie before the committee that I was told by the owner of a deli that he observed Hillary Schiff and Nadler having the old horizontal mambo going on in the cold cuts department. Vantikis says, Jimmy Dore said it best. Trump is supposedly going to overthrow our country, but he couldn't even overthrow his own car. Yeah, that's a good point. Tree Mendes is here, says, the limo story actually made Trump look better to me. I don't think he attacked the driver, but I do believe he was fired up that they wouldn't let him go. I could never figure out why he told everyone that he would be going to the Capitol with them and then he never showed up. It made me feel like he let them down. He gathered all these people. He told them to go to the Capitol and he went back to the White House. So in a strange way to hear that it was the Secret Service that said no, and he was fired up about it, it makes me feel better. Yeah, there was a big uh, criticism about Trump on that, right? That he, he sort of told them to go do it and then didn't go do it. 
We Star Lee says blast from the past, impeachment number one. Hearsay can be much better evidence than direct, as we have learned in painful instances, and it's certainly valid in this instance. Why do D love hearsay so bloody much? Well, because they can just make it up. You can just narrative your way into whatever. Where will Bannon's trial take place? Pray it's not Washington. It is. The, the D.C. Circuit Court. Youngest girl, he says hi. She's a little upset at the moment. She says she wants a shout out. The biggest of all of the shout outs today. The absolute biggest shout out. Maximum 1,000% shout outs to the youngest girly over at the three girlies household. Shout out to the youngest girly. Glad that you're here as well. Former LEO says, can they get the letter about why they declined to charge Eric Holder for refusing to honor a congressional subpoena? Uh, we'll have to see what the judge says. But no, but that's not going to be relevant to this case. And former LEO says the Sussman defense was if he believed that it was legal, it was legal. That's true. Yeah. If you, it's like George Costanza. It's not a lie if you believe it. Oh, that's true. If we believe it, then it has to be the truth. Good comments over from my friends on Locals, and thank you for your support over there. Over on YouTube, we had a couple come in. Uh, Real Chick in Canada is here. Says, Binger with gross. Binger, and remember Binger? Thomas Bingy Binger from the Kyle Rittenhouse trial, along with, uh, who was the other guy? Can't remember his name. But he had a very pejorative name that the internet was using for him. And Real Chick in Canada also says, reminds me of Binger in the Rittenhouse case. And Gage. Yeah. Yes. And Gage. Yes. Okay. So Real Chick. Remember Gage, Gage Grosskowitz, who was there and he was testifying against Kyle Rittenhouse. And it was very drawn out, very dramatic, very performative. And uh, everybody was sort of saying, bro, nobody believes you for a minute. Real Chick is saying the same thing exists here with Cassidy. Alicia Olivas became a member on YouTube. Shout out to Alicia Olivas, who's now a member. Also joined by A.M. Atkinson. We have Zha, uh, Zha Zhang is here. Shout out. Zulu's, of course, is a member. K. Bean's a member. Shout out to K. Bean. Richard Jack over on YouTube as well. Curtis Bartle's a member. You get those nice little badges. And, of course, we have our member, minds, uh, ma member mastermind coming up tomorrow. And that's going to be a lot of fun as well. Isaac Bowles says, is it just me or is Cassidy a fan of the Star Wars, Star Trek movie, Wrath of Khan? I don't know if she likes that Star Wars. Is she a fan of the Wrath of Khan? I don't know. It's a good question. Star Trek and, you know, a lot of interesting things going on in that universe. And good question, Isaac Bowles. Don't have any idea. But thank you for the support and the very interesting question. All right. And let's see what's over on Rumble. We've got Vianticus over there along with Bulldag and CW Cats is there. And Rumble Jumpin' along with Vicky C. Cat Crap Fever is chatting away over on Rumble as well. Getting some more Rumbles going on. Thank you for that. There was a comment that came in from Wacken. Says, awesome graphics package, Rob. I think he's being facetious on that. But All right, so that's over on Rumble. Of course, on our locals chat, chatting away. John Q. Simples over there. See the veil. Gypsy Muse just joined up. Welcome, Gypsy Muse. Came over to our locals community. JC, the music man, and uh, many others are chatting away. On YouTube, final shout outs to Isaac Bowles, Carlos Bustos, Lean. Shout out to Lean. What's up, Lean? JP's Mart 59, C Reads in the house, Terry B, Nut Blush City Limit says, Con! <laughs> and I'm grateful for everybody here in the chat. But that, my friends, is it for us for the day. So we will wrap it up right there. Big shout outs to everybody who is joining us on our communities at watchingthewatchers.locals.com, signing up as a supporter on YouTube, referring business to our law firm, good people charged with crimes in the state of Arizona. We have a mission to help them find safety, clarity, and hope in their cases and in their lives. We offer free case evaluations, rrlawaz.com, 480-729-6280. And you trusting our team enough to refer people over if they're in trouble with a traffic ticket, a DUI, a major felony. That's what we do. And we're very grateful for that. I, I, I very much appreciate it. If you are a member, remember tomorrow, there is not going to be a live show tomorrow. There's going to be one member mastermind program, and it's going to take place at 7 p.m. Eastern time. I was not, I, I was going to try to do it earlier and then squeeze in a show. My day filled up, so I can't do both. So it's going to be the member mastermind. And if there's other news to attend to, I'll try to squeeze in a video, but 7 p.m. 
Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific, if you want to join up on the program. Shout out to Vienticus, KBean, Zulu, Just Cause in the house, who are holding down the fort in the chat. And our Spotlight supporters, I'm very grateful to you. And the, the Spotlight supporters help support the scholarships that go out to those of you who are becoming members as well. But QSimple.com, that is a great website. You need to go learn more about it at QSimple.com. Chris Romero, of course, is another Spotlight supporter. David B3 and Dr. EMB in the house are all Spotlight supporters. And what this means is that they sign up as a Spotlight supporter on YouTube or an equivalent amount on locals and what this allows us to do is sh sort of share some of this real estate right if we can be useful to each other help each other uh you know support each other's projects or or the work that we do here we're going to try to do it because that's what this is all about but that my friends is it for us for the day we are going to leave it right there we're going to be back on Friday to do this show all again, but we are going to have our member mastermind tomorrow. So if you're not already a member, please consider joining. If you're somebody who absolutely needs a scholarship because you just can't swing the locals membership, happy to offer you a scholarship. Send me an email, robert at rrlawaz.com. I'll try to get everybody in tomorrow uh, before the, the member mastermind. But if you want to do a little homework on that first, go check out an audio version of Think and Grow Rich. Okay, it's a very impactful book talks about the power of your thinking to shape your own reality, right? And it was written back in the, I think, you know, early 1900s, and it has withstood the test of time. Very, very good book, basically free on the internet on YouTube. So check that out if you want to do your homework in preparation for the mastermind tomorrow. But that, my friends, is it for us for the day. I want to thank you for being a part of the show. Thank you to everybody who's supporting the work that we do. Sleep very well, my friends. Have a tremendous evening, and I'll see you all on the next one. Bye-bye.